My name is Tanya Dallas Lewis, and I am the Cultural Unity and Equity Coordinator and Staff Development Coordinator for Jefferson County Schools at your service. And I'm Veronique Walker from Berkeley County Schools, the Associate Superintendent of Equity and Inclusion. We're excited to have you here this evening. Indeed we are, as we continue with our month-long series every Wednesday night at six o'clock, we meet you right here from February 3rd to March 3rd. And we're having a blast as we highlight STEAM, science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics. We've invited some prestigious professors and experts in their fields, as well as the value, Dr. Veronique Walker, of our student voices. All will play a role, including right here tonight, and we're so glad that you're here with us. To start us off, we are gonna be opening up with a student STEAM highlight by none other than sophomore Lyric Johnson. She attends Jefferson High School, and she is nothing less than amazing. She's here to focus on students in STEAM. We felt it was so important, Dr. Walker and I, that our students get to see other students, young people, doing what they're doing in STEAM right now. Lyric, welcome to the virtual series. Hello, my name is Lyric Johnson and I am a sophomore at Jefferson High School in Jefferson County. Today I will be talking about African-American slash Black individuals in the STEM program. I will be specifically focusing on the engineering program. There are multiple people I could talk about. For example, Janae Thomas, Jasmine Bauer, George Martin, etc. But today I chose to highlight Jocelyn Jackson. Jocelyn Jackson is a successful Black woman from Davenport, Iowa. She is a leader, student, and researcher who wants to make a difference in the lives of young Black women interested in engineering. She also strives every day to make the profession more diverse. Before we hop into the exciting things Ms. Jackson has done and is still doing, let me give you an idea on how she found herself interested in engineering. As a senior in high school, Jocelyn's mom pushed her to take more advanced classes. One of the classes she ended up taking was an engineering design class, not knowing what would come of it. I mean, a girl who's never been interested in science or very good at math or like engineering? Well, in this case, yes. She even built a career out of it. Jocelyn received her bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering from Ohio University. Then went along to get her PhD from the University of Michigan, where she also was a first year doctoral student in the engineering education research. Jocelyn has led the board of directors of the NSBE, which stands for the National Society of Black Engineers for two years. In addition, she served as a national chair of the NSBE. One of her main goals to accomplish while working with this society is to reach their current goal of having 10,000 black engineers graduate annually by 2025. To help reach that goal, Jocelyn constantly collaborates with members, partners, and employees at the NSBE's world headquarters. She is currently researching perceptions of diversity and equality for underrepresented populations in their organizations slash industries. One thing she has already developed is a elastomeric coating with reduced wear for ice-free applications. As a result of all the wonderful things Jocelyn has done and all the success she has made, she was featured in NBC Know Your Values article, How Jocelyn Jackson is Changing the Face of Engineering. It's crazy to think about how there are only 16,000 Black women in engineering occupations in the U.S., which is just 1% of the 1.7 million other professionals. Although Jocelyn Jackson is fighting to change that. For your virtual Black History Month lecture series student highlight for engineering, I'm Larry Johnson, stemming ahead in Black excellence. Thank you for your time. Have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of the virtual meeting. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Lyric. I love the children. <laughs> I learned so much about a wonderful young lady by the name of Jocelyn Jackson. And man, I'm inspired. She's doing what she do right now. You don't have to wait. All right, coming up next is um, a young man. He's a seventh grader at Charlestown Middle School. His name is Austin Brown, and he's going to be introducing our featured guest lecturer. Austin, come on, uncover. Let's see you. Go ahead. 
Dr. Lauren Alexander Augustine. She is the, exec the executive director for the golf research program. She is responsible for overseeing all aspects of management and use of the criminal settlement. Funds from the Deepwater Horizon disaster that were entrusted with the national academies by the federal government. Prior to joining the golf research program in 2018, she served as director of the Resilient America program, which supports communities' efforts to build res res resilience and to extreme events using science and diverse stakeholder engagement. In addition, she has formally served as country director for the African Science Academy Development and Initiative. The the ASADI, a program that built scientific capacity in national academies across Africa. Outside of her work at the national academies, Lauren has served on her on the World Economic Forum Global Agenda and Council on Risk and Resilience. She is also an NATO expert for the Silver Protection Group. Lauren learned her BS in applied mathematics and system engineering in her MS in environmental planning and quality from the University of Virginia and her PhD in an interdisciplinary program that combined physical, hydrology, geomorphology, and ecology from Harvard University. Hello, everybody, um, and thank you for coming. While I get my screen up, let me just say, Thank you to the Jefferson County and the BCS for inviting me tonight. I'm really happy to be here. I am uh, Lauren Alexander Augustine, as Mr. Brown said, so thank you, Austin. And I'm gonna talk about engineering. Now I am an engineer. Um, I have three degrees in engineering, two in, at the bachelor's level of applied math and systems engineering, one at the PhD level where I mix it with science and then a master's in between on environmental science. So I'm delighted that we are here talking about STEAM and STEM and all these great things. So thank you for having me. Tonight, I wanna to talk about engineering as a way of thinking for solving society's problems. So I want you guys to think about that as we're going through this, um, through this presentation. Well, all right, let me first say thank you so much to Dr. Walker and Ms. Dallas Lewis and all of, and. Afia and Solomon and Jordan and everybody making me feel so welcome. I'm very happy to be here. So thank you for that. So I'm going to do three parts of this. I'm going to talk a little bit about what engineering is. I'm going to give you some real world ex examples of how we use engineering um, to solve real problems. And then we have a discussion period and we have some um, guests guest speakers. And so Athia and Solomon and Jordan will be joining me in section two and three. Okay, so engineering, what is engineering? And I wanna give a little bit of context for, um, for STEAM and for STEM. So I wanna start with math. Now I'm an applied mathematician and, and I like math, but it also gives us our basic vocabulary, right? It gives us our, our understanding of value. We know that two is more than one. We know that 10 is more than two. We know that 10 is a multiple of two. It gives us this basic understanding of how things relate to each other. It gives us axioms, you know? So if, if Jennifer's in 10th grade and Jim's in 10th grade and, 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 uh, and, and Susie is in the same grade as Jennifer, well, then you know she's in 10th grade. This is math. It's like the axioms, the principles, it gives us our basic understanding for engineering, right? Science answers questions of like, what is, you know, what is that green stuff growing out of the ground? What is a cell? What is that white thing in, in the blue sky? Science helps answer what is to describe our physical world and describe the processes around us. That's science. So if you ask like, well, what is that? And what is that? Those are scientific questions. When you get to applied science, that's when you take the math and the science and you say, well, for what use? So it's good to know about you know, relative values of speed or, or power, but then you apply it. So if you have power, can you move a car? Can you move a rocket? These are applied science, right? So that's when you put it into use. 
art gives us elements of form, style, words, and it gives it meaning, meaning. So when you see, you know, clouds and you know that it might mean rain and rain gives you a feeling. We need art to take what we see in the physical world and give it some context, right? But really, we're gonna talk about engineering. And so when we think about engineering, oftentimes you think about bridges or computers, airplanes, rockets, gas, gasoline, petroleum, energy. You think of these kinds of things of engineering where you might build something or you might um, you know, create connections, right? To do something. I wanna challenge all of you to think of engineering as a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking in dogged pursuit of, of the question how, right? So if science is about what, engineering is how. How can we make things work? How can we make something faster, better, stronger, safer, cheaper? How can we advance the state of being? This is really what engineering is about, right? And so while we think about bridges and roads and, and you know, gasoline and, uh, and factories and stuff like that, we're really also just trying to make life better, right? We wanna be safer, we wanna be stronger. So this is what engineering is. So as we go through this, I want you guys to think about, you know, how can we, that is the engineering, right? So I'm gonna give you an example from nature, just to, just to remind you, it's not all about training and math and physics. It's the squirrel, right? Everyone's seen the squirrels. And I wanna say that these are, these are the engineers in nature. Because have you guys ever seen squirrels try to get the food out of a bird feeder, right? They are ingenious. They, you, you can see all these different examples. They leap, they fly, they hang, they, they drop because they are in dogged pursuit of how to get the food out of the feeder. And this is what we do in engineering. We try all kinds of things. Some things work, some things don't work so well. But you know, the thing is we're not really squirrels, right? We're people. And our problems are bigger than just getting food out of a feeder, um, even though food is a big deal. So let me give you a real world example. Um, take the Gulf of Mexico, right? So at the bottom of the United States, you got Texas on, on to the west, all the way over to Florida on the east. And that body of water right there is the Gulf of Mexico. Now, let's think about the Gulf of Mexico. 1.5 million barrels of crude oil come out of that body of water every single day, every single day. It contributes an enormous part of our, of our uh, national GDP, about 30% um, of it, and so, that's one thing out of the Gulf of Mexico. 40 million people live in those five states, Florida, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, 40 million people. That's something important too. But those states have the lowest health outcomes in the country. These are the states, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana. They're the unhealthiest people in our country. They are the least educated people in our country. They have the highest rates of poverty of people in our country. So you have all this money coming out of, the, out of the water in terms of oil. You have all these people and they're not doing so well, right? On the natural side, you have a lot of beautiful estuaries, bays, rich wildlife, all these valuable wetlands, but we are losing that land at a rate of one football field per hour. That means at the end of this, of this session tonight, they will have lost one football field off the coast of Louisiana, just tonight, while we're talking to each other. And that, that is from the Mississippi River, it's from, it's from sea level rise. So you can see this Gulf of Mexico area has a lot going on in it, right? That's a real world example. But sometimes these things come together in a horrible combination. Oil spills take out wildlife. Storms come in, kill people, ruin the assets. All these things happen in the same place. So this is, this is the real world circumstance, right? And so how do we address these issues? So I'm gonna tell you something. It is my job, my actual job to do this, right? And it really is an engineering problem because I have to think all the time, how can I, right? Going back to how can I, how can I make the Gulf of Mexico 
more sustainable in terms of the environment, more uh, resilient in terms of its economy, its energy production, and more healthy for the people who live there. That's my job. That's what I do. Now I was given some resources for this, right? I was given, uh, I was given $500 million in 2013 and 30 years. This says 900 million because we invested that money, right? So when you invest money, you get payment on your principal. And so we have about $900 million in 30 years to answer that question. And so every day it's like an engineering problem in my job. And we have to, I have to come up with a function where X is energy and Y is the environment and Z is people. And I gotta bring it all together to say, we're gonna use this money, we're gonna use this time, and we're going to solve for this function. This is the kind of engineering program and problem that we, um, that I do every single day. So I asked three of my new friends, Solomon, a sophomore at Jefferson High School, Athea, a senior at Martinsburg High School, and Jordan, a junior at Springs Mill High School, about what some of the pressing societal problems are from their points of view. And I asked them, I said, okay, someone take an engineering question, someone take a health question, someone take an environmental question. And they did that. And this is what they said. Solomon, you are up first. You wanna unmute yourself and put your camera on? All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Solomon. Um, I said one pressing issue concerning math and engineering is the search for an efficient use of energy. Um, most energy is used today is non renewable and is not used as efficiently as it could be. Like you said, with engineering, um, the thought process of how we make things better, how we make things go faster, stuff like that. Great. And then I asked. Afia, she took the environment question. Afia, what did you have to say about the environment? Um, I think a, pers a very pressing issue in the environment right now is um, the use of the things that have been engineered for um, agriculture and how there are ways that we can move forward and improve such as things like vertical farms that um, are better for the environment and conserve more energy and water. Um, and uh, things like vertical farming kind of prevent the issues that are caused by other things like irrigation systems and soil degradation. So um, looking into more ways to prevent those issues is something that we have and that's coming up and that can help us to solve the issues we're facing now. And um, I my own plans for helping my own community environmental wise is trying to look at a problem that Martinsburg has with um, runoff and pollution in the water and kind of uh, seeing what I can do as a student to develop ways or create funding to kind of improve those things in my own community. That's fantastic, thank you. And then finally, we asked Jordan to talk about the help, a help pressing societal problem, Jordan. Want to unmute yourself and come on screen and tell us yeah, about yes, the problem you see? So the problem I see in the health and medical field is definitely heart disease. Um, it's very common in the U.S. Um, each year, about 655,000 people die from heart disease each year. Um, so I feel like it's very serious. Um, and I feel like we should definitely spread awareness, um, get active, um, allow people to have a good understanding of what heart disease is and how critical it is. Um, and not only for now, like just for future generations to come, because we don't want the same problems happening, you know, that we have now and in the past. We want our future to be better and the gen future generations ahead to be better as well. Excellent. So the question that we had for these three, right? How do you get to clean and efficient energy sources? How do you get food in, uh, in an environmentally sound way so you're not suffering from runoff and pollution? And how do you get people to live longer, right? Dealing with heart disease. So these three um, brilliant minds coming in from high school, I wanna ask you guys, how could we get one solution that would satisfy something in the societal challenge that you have? 
Let me start by asking Afia. I'm going to start with you, Afia. We um, get um, your sorry. We get your vertical farming, right? We get mm -hmm. it going. Does it require energy to farm? And if so, how does that fit in with Solomon's idea for uh, renewable energy sources? Um, in in all ways of farming, there is um, always going to be energy used. It's I guess in this case, it's just a matter of how much and uh, going off of what Solomon was saying, uh, vertical farming would be a great way to cut down on energy use and the use of water. Um, they use um, hydrophonic uh, filtering, I believe, to uh, basically filter out the water being used and kind of recycle the nutrients. So that cuts down to only 5% of water used today already in agriculture. So that's energy efficient. They're also um, because they're built vertically and instead of in the land, that preserves the amount of um, land that we can use to produce food and let that land um, kind of return to its natural state. So that's, um, oh, um, also going off of energy because these places are uh, more accessible than I guess farms, it would cut down on um, the amount of fuel it takes to travel and transport foods globally and nationally by 95%. So that's um, very, it's a very energy efficient option. And uh, from what I've researched, it does create healthier foods because of its controlled environment. So, so uh, Solomon, so let me, let me stop you there, Afia. Thank you, excellent answer, excellent. Solomon, you have a vertical farm. What kind of energy sources do you think would be best to use on a vertical farm? Um, energy sources, I don't think there'd be a, I guess, specific, but yes, with the vertical farm to be more efficient, we could use renewable or renewable resources like wind power or water power. Solar maybe? Yeah, we could do solar too. All that would yep. be a lot healthier to the environment because of pollution of the non-renewable. And of course that would make make everything healthier in the whole world, make the air healthier. So that will also solve some of Jordan's problems. <laughs> See, there you go. And Jordan, so we get this, we get solar power and wind power and some hydropower to to give some power to Afia's vertical farm. What is in it for you? How does this help solve your problem? Well, just like Solomon just said, uh, better oxygen. Um, I mean, we need oxygen to breathe, obviously. Um, so I think if, if we have clean oxygen, um, that can definitely boost our, our life expectancy instead of having different particles in the air that can clog us up per se and just really make us feel different and not healthy enough. Do you think that maybe they could grow some healthy food? That they would, could as well. They that could maybe definitely cut down grow, on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some natural foods, um, definitely natural sugars. Um, you can grow fruits, vegetables. I mean, those are two key things that we need. And um, back to the heart disease thing, like, I mean, you, you got to cut down on cut down on a lot of fatty stuff, eat natural foods. So, I mean, if you, you have your natural you know, mother nature's food right there. So, I mean, you can definitely eat that and that will definitely reduce the risk of heart disease. So I just want to say these three never met each other before tonight and already came up with a societal approach or, or a, an engineering approach of combining, selecting out to solve a big, not just one societal problem, but maybe three. So this is the way that engineers think all the time. And oh, by the way, we always have to work with other people. You know, engineers don't just get to work by themselves in a corner sometimes, you know, but usually when you're on the big problems, you have to have someone from health. You have to have someone from the, from the um, social sciences, someone from the environment. So this is a really good example. And I just wanna thank you guys for making my case and showing everyone what engineering thinking looks like about combining um, different types of technologies together. So I'm gonna to turn to discussion and see if you um, have any questions 
for me or for the other panelists. Thank you for that brilliant and wonderful demonstration of teamwork, engineering, and everything that would make us be successful to work together for a better environment. To those of you who are participating this evening, you have the opportunity to ask questions. You have can put that in the Q&A section or you can type it in the chat. If you have any questions that you want answered this evening, uh, we are definitely open for your questions. So while we're waiting, and I, I do have a question for the yes. students, um, how did you how did you feel working with one another, meeting each other for the first time this evening, and solving a problem with Dr. Um, Lauren tonight? Jordan, Afia, or great. Solomon, felt great. Honestly, yeah, it felt great. I mean, we don't even know each other, but we still tackled, I mean, three things. So I mean, it was cool. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty cool. Us all. Not, not even knowing each other, all coming here to just discussing what we what we researched and then combining it and then talking about and discussing and see how it all relates to each other. Yeah, it was a great interaction and I liked hearing everyone else's ideas and it was just cool to kind of see it in real time combine and make sense. And it was great learning more from uh, Dr. Augustine, so. Any questions do from our panelists? Do you guys, oh, you do have a question. Well, a comment, it just says, I'm so happy to know that there are so many young achievers. Yes. I agree. So for people who are thinking about being an engineer, let me just say, it is true. You need to at least like math. If, you're, if you don't feel particularly good at it, that's okay. You have to at least try it and you have to, make a good effort because everything does go back to that math piece, but it falls in place, right? And, and for those of you who might be thinking, you know, well, what I want to do it, let me just, who wants to guess what the highest paid type of engineering is? Just throwing it out there for the chat. Who, who wants to guess? If you're an engineer and you have a bachelor's degree, what kind of engineering do you think is going to make you the most money? Four year degree. We have someone who said petroleum. That's right. There's a person in the petroleum, whoever said that, do they have, an, do they have a guess of how much a four-year bachelor's degree would earn in petroleum engineering? They did not mention. Let me tell you, about $150,000. 150, yeah, $150,000 per year, four-year degree. If you go into aerospace, you're about at $120,000 a year. Going to civil engineering, you're about at $100,000 a year. So it's not just about solving problems and never having a boring day at work. You can make a very, very good living. Another question, is there a place in the community that we can test some of these theories? Ooh, Afia. I'm gonna to turn to you. You said you were actually working on this. Is that right? Where you live on a, on a farming and a, um, a runoff project? Is that what you said, Afia? Um, yeah, um, when I was in the ecology club at my school um, before the pandemic happened, um, me and the current running president were discussing ideas on how to um, kind of deal with the own, our own community problem with runoff pollution. And um, I, I saw a pamphlet at the local library that kind of described the issues and how we could help. So I introduced those ideas to him and um, we were kind of planning on like figuring something out for that. But fortunately the pandemic happened and he graduated. So we didn't get to go through with that. But um, I do plan on kind of getting back into that when I can and seeing what I can do to continue that in the future. So that would basically consist of um, making, we could volunteer to clean up um, local yards and neighborhoods because um, certain things like leaves and harmful chemicals can um, contribute to uh, polluting water systems. And then it's also spreading the word about what we're doing and like how to help and stuff like that that could really help with the situation at hand. 
Great, great answer. I, I see a question from um, Reggie Logan about uh, types of engineering. Can I discuss a, a couple more types? I'd be happy to. The most common type of engineering is mechanical engineering. And mechanical engineers are really about how physical things work together. And what they often make are airplanes, airplanes, cars, things like that. Um, and that is the most popular um, undergraduate degree is, is, um, is mechanical. The second type, I'll, I'll just list a few here and just get my list straight. So I'm, the, that's the first one. Mechanical is the most popular. Second one is electrical. So if you think about um, building a computer, building robots, things that need electrical current to go through them, that's electrical engineering. Even biomedical has an electrical piece to it because oftentimes you need that, um, that uh, electromagnetic um, for source of energy in biomedical stuff. So electrical engineering is number two. Civil engineering is number three. Bridges, roads, houses, structures, wastewater treatment plants, civil engineering. Computer engineering. This is, a, this is where people work on hardware and software and how to integrate them so that you can get everything you need in your phone, right? The harder piece is a software piece. That's computer engineering. Chemical engineering. This is, um, I think if you do chemical engineering, you can do anything in the world. This is about understanding interactions at the chemical level. Chemical engineers often work in industry. They often work in uh, oil and gas. They often work in manufacturing. So it's often also about like, um, you know, how to make things and how to make sure that you dispose of them safely. Biomedical engineering is next on the list in terms of popularity. Industrial engineering is often about optimizing performance. So if anyone orders from Amazon and you get something in a box and it has to be, and it's packed amazingly, it's packed for safety and it's packed for efficiency, that's an industrial engineer, right? Pack, or optimize performance, reduce waste. Um, aerospace is next. Aerospace does airplanes, rockets, turbines, things that use wind, or air for power or for movement. That's aerospace or aeronautical engineering. And then finally, the last one on the list in terms of frequency is petroleum engineering. That's the, that's the least one. It's uh, just because there's very few programs in it, but as we talked about, it is quite difficult. <laughs> so um, normally when you go to engineering school, the first two years of engineering school are common across all those different types because you have to get your math background, you have to get your physics background, you have to get your chemistry background, and that's all kind of the same. And then in your second, in your third and fourth years, you start to branch out. You say, no, I'm in, in mechanical, and then you start doing mechanical stuff for your chemical and mechanical stuff. So I will stop with that. Reggie, I hope that answered your question. And we have two more questions before we move to our next section. And this one is from the superintendent of Jefferson County Schools. Dr. Bondi Gibson, what classes in middle school did Dr. Augustine find sparked the greatest interest in engineering? Biology, if you can believe it. And I had an amazing, wacky biology teacher who was always like, well, what about this specimen? And he was always asking these crazy questions. And he really just sparked in me um, an interest just to ask more questions and more questions. And then, not in middle school, but in high school, I had a really great physics teacher who made physics so approachable, so easy. It's like, of course you have gravity and gravity affects everything. And you're like, well, no, I knew that. And then just the way that he presented it, it was like, oh, I can, I can get that. So, you know, and I always liked math. So math was there, but I, I really loved biology. I really loved it. And then when I got into physics, it just, I love that too. So those are the two big classes. And was engineering your first career choice? No, I still am trying to figure out what I wanna be when I grow up. Um, I think it's a journey. And what I would say is that what engineering does, if you're thinking about it, I, I would recommend everybody think very, very seriously. If you have the aptitude and the interest, because from engineering, you can do anything, right? I mean, think about it. If you're an engineer, you're going to have some high level for logic, right? Which means you could be a lawyer, which means you could be a doctor, 
which means you could be a writer, right? Because all these things require one thing to build on another. And it's such a great background and such a great foundation that um, I think everyone should be an engineer. And I think that if a squirrel can be an engineer, you guys can be engineers. So I think that you should think about that. Um, and I guess I would also just say that the other piece about engineering is, there, I guess there's two other pieces. One is that you'll never be unemployed. Even in the federal government, I'll tell you right now, anyone, ask your parents, if you, they apply for a job at the federal government, there's this terrible form you have to fill out. Unless you're an engineer, then they can hire you on the spot. So one, you'll never be unemployed. Number two, you will never be afraid of the math. You know what I mean? Like when someone comes to you and they bring you something crazy and you're like, ooh, I was told there'd be no math. As an engineer, you're like, that's fine, bring it on. I'll challenge you. And you're not scared of it. So um, that's what I would say. It wasn't my, my, I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I grew up, when I grew up, but it has worked out very, very well for me. Thank you. And now we'll turn it back over to Tanya Dallas Lewis. Thank you so much. Well, I just want to say that um, as someone who could just witness this interaction, it was wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Lauren Alexander Augustine. Um, your energy is wonderful. It's inspiring. Um, you uh, just, um, I don't know, you just instilled this sense of wonder, even in me. <laughs> so I too am a student and ever, you know, just ever learning. So thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you for this valuable lesson that you've shared with our students and allowing them to get involved and have a seat at the table. That's so important. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. No problem. At this time, we are going to hear from one of my former students. I used to be an ELA teacher for Berkeley County Schools, and I had the pleasure of having this young man in my ELA English language arts classroom. His name is Noah Selman. And the moment I met him, I knew that he was indeed something special. And I never forgot him. So he's one of my school babies, but he's not a baby anymore. Here to do the final student STEAM highlight of the week for engineering is sophomore Noah Selman from Martinsburg High School. Noah, we're ready for you. Okay. Hello, my name is uh, Noah Summon. Like she said, I'm a sophomore at Martinsburg High School in Berkeley County. And today I will be talking about David. Uh, for, all, for my Black students in STEAM today, I'll be talking about David Opeti Ibo. I'm still hoping I pronounced that right. But 20 year old David was born and raised in Nigeria. Nigeria is one of the uh, countries in Africa that is a, like a real life version of Wakanda. Since a very young age, David was very talented at creating airplanes from paper and other household items. His passion for technology and aircrafts led him to enroll in the International College of Aeronautics in 2015. He was also able to become an instructor while studying. At 19 years old, he had, had obtained his remote license pilot his pilot license and became an active member in Nigeria's Unmanned System and Robotics Association. In 2018, he led a team of five students from the International College of Aeronautics at the Zinthi Aircraft Building Company in Missouri. Currently, David is working as a freelancer for various organizations to provide top-notch drone services and products. He spends his free time building and flying remote-controlled models for fun, helping students with the robotic projects, playing keyboard, and providing digital services, such as writing sales copies for various business and product niches. That's not right. And for your virtual Black History Month lecture series, student highlights in engineering, I'm Noah Selman. So Noah, before you go, um, one of the things that I remember about you being in my classroom was your um, intellectual capacity. It was ever expanding. Um, your Thank intelligence, you. uh, your, your ability for higher, critical, higher order thinking and critical thinking. So I'm gonna ask you a question about the research that you just did on David. You ready? Okay. What did you think as you researched about a young man that looks like you 
and as your, as your age range, what were you thinking about what he's accomplished so far? How did that make I you feel? was impressed because he's almost, there's not really that huge of a difference in our ages. Mm -hmm. And he's doing so much more at higher levels than me. You know, it's kind of, it's uh, nice to see. It is nice to see. And I think it probably also shows you that if he can do it, who else can do it? Me and you everyone else can. <laughs> and everyone else can. Good job, young man. I miss having you in my classroom. Thank you so much for lending your research skills and learning about someone new um, and uh, being here with us today. I know your time is precious as a sophomore. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'll see you later. Or I'll overhear you playing online, playing video games with my son, Dylan Sampson, who is also tuned in tonight. Um, before we move on to the last uh, portion of our time tonight, we actually have a representative from the Health Science Technology Academy. Um, they are um, stepping up and wanting to announce their recruiting efforts for students that are now eligible, and those are eighth graders, of course. I just wanted to do a quick shout out to our superintendents. I would love for them to, if, if they're willing, to um, unmic and un, you know, turn on the camera for just a second if, if, if they're willing. I just wanted to just get a, a quick word from them because we just have a little bit of time to hear from our superintendents tonight, if they're willing. I know I'm putting them on the spot. <laughs> Dr. Gibson, I see your beautiful Hi. face, but I hear nothing. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> No, I just wanted to say thanks so much for the invitation, uh, as always, and I cannot be uh, any happier about seeing the students and about their level of participation. So, uh, Dr. Augustine, I appreciate the fact that you recognize that uh, it doesn't matter how far you go or what you do, you're always a teacher and you're always a student. So, thanks for reinforcing that. I love that. I thought it was so cute when she said uh, she still hasn't figured out what she wants to be exactly. when she grows up. <laughs> we, we, uh, people think we ask kids uh, because, you know, we're nurturing them. Really, we're trying to get good ideas. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. So this is the third of uh, the five part series and have enjoyed each evening. Uh, I think the message, and um, I really liked how uh, Dr. Augustine uh, worked through with the groups and kind of problem solved and also applied uh, solutions. So uh, my hat's off, but you know, this is a great series. It, it sends a positive message. And I think uh, role models are so important in students' lives today. Uh, and uh, you guys have done a, a wonderful job. So to you and Dr. Walker, thank you so much. And I look forward to, uh, the next two uh, of the five uh, part series. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and one of the things, uh, just piggyback, piggybacking off of what you said, Dr. Murphy, uh, to your point of her, um, the way that she solved problems with the students, I noticed how that she uh, put herself on equal footing with the students. She created a partnership with the students. And so she was not the one sole person bearing all the wisdom and the knowledge, right? She was also engaging um, uh, almost in a, a, a circular way. You know what I mean? Where it was just, it was teacher and student and student and teacher. So she was not only the teacher, but she was the student and they were also teachers and also the student. I think that's a great um, teacher uh, skill and practice to model. Thank you for that. And she got the best out of them because they came up with great ideas. So at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, sir. Absolutely. All right, Kenneth, welcome, sir. On the behalf of HISTA, uh, we wanted to make sure that since we're talking about technology and engineering and all these uh, wonderful um, uh, fields that our students can get into, let's talk to you. Who are you and why are you here, Kenneth? Thank you, Ms. Dallas Lewis, for giving me this opportunity to speak to everyone. Uh, my name is Kenneth Meni. I'm the fixed site coordinator for Easter for the Easter Panando. Um, I'm here to share with you like what is Easter. I know everyone over here, basically, most people know about Easter, and most people too, they don't know about Easter. The Health Science Technology Academy is a mentoring program in the state of West Virginia that help participating high school students enter and succeed in STEM-based and undergraduate and graduate degree program. 
Um, I'm having some reasons over here why you should choose Easter. Some highlights we're having over here is like 99% of Easter students graduate and have attended college. And also 87% of Easter students earn a four year college degree or better. And furthermore, um, what does Easter offer? Easter offers an in-state college tuition waiver. They offer research experience and also offer summer camps. And all these are free. And the criteria to meet for this Easter program, you need to be, you need to meet four out of these first four criteria, which is African American, low income, low income and first generation. I'm having technology issues right here. And also like, I believe everyone is rural over here and everyone meets that last criteria. You just need to pick one out of the rest three first criteria to meet. And while making the Easter application, a student needs to be 3.0 GPA. They need to meet the 3.0 GPA and also like they need to write an essay while making the application. We start accepting applications for Easter student from eighth grade, uh, eighth graders which are progressing to ninth grade. And also I'll be posting like the application link to make an Easter application on the chat right now. And lastly, I would like to introduce um, Kathy Martin. She's, she's like the head of Easter. I invited her over for the program too. Thank you. I just want to again say that uh, Kenneth is our uh, person that we invited tonight to just make students aware, especially parents and students, caregivers, students, eighth graders, Health Science Technology Academy, HISTA. Uh, we've been doing a lot of talk about uh, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And so I thought it would be great to have a representative from HISTA from the Eastern Panhandle. And there is Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hey, how are you? And thank I'm you for great. having me. This thank is you. Um, um, I'm the director of HISTA, and um, we're just so thrilled to have this time to um, spread the word about this wonderful program because um, what we do is we uh, level the playing field for our high school students. And in doing so, um, they learn wonderful, wonderful skills, research skills. They make a difference in their community. Um, in this pipeline program, it's four years. Um, you meet once a week after school. Um, you get to come to summer camps, you attend two of those, um, and you um, complete a community-based research project every year. So our kids are, are working with um, scientists and engineers and um, all kinds of, of community members and people across the state to um, address issues that they find that are important to them in their community. So it really dovetails in um, with your main speaker and um, it, uh, addressing things they see and um, then pulling in resources and seeing how we can uh, make the world a better place and West Virginia a better place. So um, like Kenneth said, um, in the Eastern Panhandle, 100% of the students who come through the HISTA pipeline attend college, um, that 89% of the students graduate from college with a four-year degree. And HISTA will follow you through um, graduate school, that tuition waiver, so that if you're in medicine, um, you're not paying tuition. If you're in a STEM field, you're not paying tuition. So um, what we're doing is, is we're preparing a workforce for West Virginia. Um, and keeping our talent here. So uh, I love it. Well, thank you for that information. And Ms. Morton, I'm going to ask that if you don't mind, if you can populate our chat box with the website information or any contact information so that our caregivers and parents or community members who are on here tonight can make sure that they share this information. And I have invited you and Kenneth back for our next, uh, our remaining, our last two <laughs> Black History Month virtual lecture series so that we can continue putting the word out so we can make sure that we get our students that support that they need. So thank you. Well, that's wonderful. And thank you. It's This has been a fabulous uh, evening and um, just, it, it's so great to see the kids and the speakers <laughs> and um, you've done a wonderful job. So thank you for letting us be a little part of this. Absolutely.
it takes it takes a village, right? That's <laughs> that's what they say. It's true. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, to my partner in good, Dr. Veronique Walker. Man, we're at the end of another night. Uh, I want to make sure people know what's coming ahead. And so next week, next week, turn to your neighbor and say, <laughs> next Wednesday. Next, next week. Wednesday, <laughs> next week. We've got a powerhouse, another powerhouse. You know, Dr. Lauren Alexander Augustine. We have Professor Dr. Phil Branch. <laughs> we had Dr. Joseph uh, Graves Jr. I mean, we've had some amazing people, but next week, who we got coming next week? Do you remember Dr. Walker? I'll let you handle that one. <laughs> <laughs> we have Dr. P. P. Pimiento Bay coming. Now he's formerly of West Virginia University, an Africana studies professor. And now he's currently uh, in Kentucky. Uh, doing the same thing, doing some great things. Still a wonderful uh, professor and around the world, highly sought after when it comes to Africana studies and Black and African American history. So he'll be joining us. Look him up. You can find him on Google. Uh, he's been a guest on PBS. He's been, done all kinds of documentaries. This man is, is really interesting. So I'm really excited about him joining us for the arts. And then for our last Wednesday, which is March the 3rd, we have Dr. Robert Q. Berry. He's going to be joining us as our mathematician. And we have some more students for each of those weeks. And I'm really excited. I'm excited too. All right. Well, um, I had a great time tonight. Did you? I did. It, it's very inspiring. I saw that word used and it was inspiring to hear just the technology, the engineering, and all of the wonderful bright minds who participated this evening. Absolutely. And so on behalf of Dr. Walker and myself, we want to thank you guys for joining us one more again. <laughs> that means one more time and uh, spending this time with us as we continue to highlight Black History Month steaming ahead and excellent. Shout outs to our students, Afia. Shout out to Jordan, Solomon, Noah. Shout out to Lyric. Austin, you are the bomb.com. You read that bio, young man. I don't know where you are. I don't know if you left, but I just want to um, affirm and validate all of our students. And we cannot wait to continue to see you all shine brightly and to contribute not only to your local communities, but to the world at large. And Dr. Lauren Alexander Augustine, I, I'm going to steal that line. I haven't figured out what I want to be when I grow up either. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. All right, everybody. Good night. Stay safe and stay warm. Good night, everyone.